How good is this crop of interior defensive linemen? We're delivering our final rankings for the 2024 NFL Draft today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Want to issue a big thank you, shout out, and welcome to our everydayers. Those of you who make Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every single day, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Joseph, I assume you also got the memo about wearing black today to commemorate Bill Belichick's uh, <laughs> job with the Atlanta Falcons. You got a chance to read that this morning, did you? I did get a chance to read that ESPN story detailing Bill Belichick's failed attempt at getting hired in this coaching cycle. Yes, I did. You said he didn't want full control, man. I know. What was what was the biggest takeaway from you for that story? I didn't finish it. Okay. Yeah. yeah so that, it, that's a good it, takeaway to have. Is I'm not yeah. done. So ask me yeah. later. I got into the start where it was kind of getting into the setting this the scene of looking at that Falcons job, feeling like he had a good shot at it, uh, making it clear that he didn't want total control. And then, you know, I realized how long it was and how little time I had and had to pull out, you know? Well, um, I'll, I'll spoil it for you. The biggest takeaway for me was Robert Kraft allegedly calling Arthur Blank to tell him not to trust Bill Belichick. And that being a catalyst in him not getting the job was uh, the biggest takeaway for me. So, so how did, <laughs> after that tenure, for it to come out at the very end that he no longer trusts him. That's there you go. Very interesting. And so, they, they've certainly had a lot of like turnover. Like they've, they've had Dimitrov and PO. There's been people that have cross pollinated those two organizations between the, uh, the dynasty documentary series, which effectively just turned into a bill Belichick smear campaign. And then now this, um, mm-hmm. no love lost from the parties of the dynasty. And uh, you hate to see it. Now, Don Shula is a, a big, avid Don Shula wins record guy. You absolutely hate to see Bill Belichick frozen out of this draft cycle or hiring cycle. He's not getting a job, man. What What's going to be different next year? Dallas is going to become available. That, that's what people keep saying. The Giants is going to become available, and they're going to hire Bill. Interestingly enough, in the story, one of the things that was included that a close personal friend of Bill Belichick anonymously said they felt Bill's only chance at being a head coach again in the NFL was Jerry Jones. Man. Which, yeah, I think if you look at, at the way things ended with Bill and say say you don't want total control football operations all you want, that's how you've operated for forever. I would be inclined to agree with that that idea. It's not a very appealing turnover everything that you have for what would be the oldest coach in the league for who knows how long to totally redo everything about how you do everything. A conversation for another day today is Bill, about Bill would love defensive tackle talk. You know, he really would. defensive line talk. So I feel um, like we're doing him justice here. I think show. at some point, one of our objectives is we need a Belichick impersonation from you um, on this episode at some point, but well. <laughs> all right, let's go. Interior defensive line rankings today on the podcast. Yesterday, we did wide receivers. We're going to work through our defensive linemen, interior defensive linemen today. Kyle, I think generally speaking, I I like this crop of players. Um, I feel like there's good values throughout the, I I mean, really throughout the first four or five rounds that I think you can find some answers. And um, I think we got a couple of really nice first round grades, at least in my opinion. I have two. Same. And this is no, knowing what the top of it looks like and knowing that, that that was segment one. That's why we probably felt a little bit of mobility to spend a couple minutes talking about Bill. <laughs> um, 
Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton, I think it's a question of what order you have those two players from Texas and Illinois. Uh, I do have a comfortable margin between the two players, though. Like, I have one with a top 10 grade, and I have one with a first-round grade. Top 10 grade. Let's go, yeah. Kyle. I have one knocking on the door of a top 10 grade, and I have one that's a firm one. Byron Murphy. Yeah, so Byron Murphy. Your defensive line. Same here. I love so much about him, man. Like, I know we did an entire episode on on these players, so I don't want to like rehash that. You should definitely go back and check it out. But like, athleticism, size, the dense build, the built-in leverage, young, right? He's he's twenty-one years old, and so is Johnny Newton. So you got a couple of younger guys here at the top. Um, just a guy that is explosive. I think there's upward momentum in terms of his growth as a player. Mm -hmm. I think some team's going to get a really solid pick there in Byron Murphy in the first round. Uh, what the only critique is the stature, right? But it's also I, not a critique. It's not a problem. Yeah. Um, to, to be six, six foot and one half inch. I think that's how you see a player that plays at 300 pounds play with the stoutness that he has. And, uh, you know, his, his pass rush profile is really good. I, I think there's a lot of development that can still be had as far as his actual counters. Again, not to rehash that entire episode, but there's an early down floor that exists with effective third down play that I think is only going to get better. And when you pair that with the athletic profile, um, you just have a player who I think can be a three down snap taker with disruptiveness and really be a problem. And I think I think he he checks almost every box you could possibly want checked. What's the highest he goes? Like, where's the destination? Mm. If you said the absolute ceiling for where he gets drafted, where is that? I know we talk about Atlanta as that first defensive player spot, um, and that's commonly Dallas Turner. Maybe sometimes you see Quinion Mitchell. Is Byron Murphy a player we should talk more about there? Minnesota at 11. I feel like the Raiders are We're, we're assuming their... Minnesota's leaving that spot. Right, right. We think. Um, and then maybe it depends on who they send it to. If they send it to Arizona, maybe Arizona, if they fall back to 11. Possibly, yeah. Would be a, like at least a, a scheme fit, uh, a, a talent appropriate value pick. Uh, I would say the Raiders, but they just dropped 27 and a half on Christian Wilkins per, so probably not there. And then you're getting into Seattle. Nobody's going to make a mistake by drafting him, I'll Cincinnati. tell you that. Cincinnati, yeah. Makes like sense I, I think the feeling, there, there's a couple of teams in the first 12 picks that it could make some sense, but you just feel that that team is going to go in a different direction. Yeah. Even so Denver. I think then you get to the top of the second half of the first round. And, and at that point, I, I think at any point there, you would not be surprised. You said you have a pretty comfortable gap between Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton being aware that they're both first round grades. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to frame a question to you like this. What are the big distinguishing factors between the two that has them highly graded? but also mm -hmm. you find some separation in the two. I think Byron's leverage and run defense just has so much versatility in the ways in like taking double teams, being able to penetrate, being able to scrape and cross face and deconstruct blocks where Johnny Newton, I thought was a little bit more uh, first step reliant, but then also like a lot, I felt a lot of his plays against the run were falling back off of blocks when the back tried to cut mm -hmm. against the green and just his vision was really good there. Um, I thought Byron had a little bit more consistency with his pad level against the run. I think he anchored the line of scrimmage much more consistently against the run. And I thought he won against the run in more different ways. Now, Johnny has, more ways he beats you as a pass rusher. And I think he turns the corner better than Byron Murphy does. Yeah. But turning the corner, like how much does it matter at three versus as a three technique versus if you're playing head up on a tackle, which both of those guys did in some instances. And I think that's where you really saw the cornering ability for Johnny Newton that popped. 
So if I'm just trying to project like, okay, where are you going to take your rushes at the next level to try to, to put weight into this thing that Johnny does better? How do I value it versus they both have really good first steps and use their first steps and win a lot with their first steps. Um, and then I thought Byron Murphy kind of in his pass rushes, I thought he pinballed off of bodies yeah. a little bit better and maintained that forward momentum through those where I thought Johnny was much better in like half man rush situations. Yeah. Byron does pinball off contact and like plays off of it and uses it for momentum yeah. really, really well. I, I was watching Tavondre sweat this morning actually. And of course my eyes are naturally peeping over at Byron Murphy from time to time. And I saw that uh, on several occasions. So good call out there. All right. Uh, we like, or I'll speak for myself. I like these two first round grades. I really like some of the options on day two, right. if you miss out on one of these guys. So we're going right. to break that down for you here in just a moment. So be sure to stick with us. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to be certain that you can find as many quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. And on LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats right now. It might not have the time or resources to hire, and LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. In fact, they just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even more simple and quicker. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So chalk in segment one. I know there's some split amongst draft Knicks, whether Johnny Newton or Byron Murphy's the, the better interior defensive lineman. And I will say the gap between Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton is half as large as the gap that I have from Johnny Newton to my third rated interior defensive line. So it is comfortably those two, even though I comfortably have one over two. In terms of how we can frame this conversation, I have three second round grades and I have three third round grades. Same. Okay, so that they're Same. very very good things. Very good things. I How many did you do total? Three. I have 15. I have 16 interior defensive linemen graded in this year's okay. class. Here are my second round grades. Just Christian. stop after the, the twos. Yep. Chris Jenkins, Michigan. Okay. Michael Hall Jr., Ohio State. Darius Robinson, Missouri. Okay. So if you have Darius Robinson. That would be 17 interior defensive linemen for me. I do have him graded as an edge in my rankings because he's he's played both. Yep. So to invoke Darius Robinson's name in here, uh, I would then have four second round grades. So it would be Darius Robinson from Missouri would be my third interior defensive lineman if I put him in that, that category. Then Michael Hall from Ohio State, Brandon Dorless uh, from University of Oregon, and Rook Ororhoho. Said that right? Yeah. Ro -ho -ho? Yeah. Did did I actually? Because yeah, you, you did. I'm just not getting into it. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just going to say <laughs> yes. I'm not. I'm not going to affirm it, pronounce it myself. Yeah, you got Luke it. Rook is great. Is job. my fourth interior defensive lineman in this year's class that I have a two on. I have a late two on him. Okay. So Chris Jenkins is the one that we do not share. And I I'll say this about Rook. Rook is a half point away. From being a two. So he's kind of a two, three. Okay. For so me. we're separated by fractions because he's like a quarter of a point for being a three for me. Yeah. So we're not going to split hairs there. I have yeah. Brandon Dorless mid, like, like a firm three, like just a solid three. He's not really knocking on the door for a two for me. Okay. Um, we both really like Michael Hall. What yeah. what fun tape was that? Like, why is there? Why are not people going crazy over this guy? Uh, because his sack totals aren't good. That was one of those situations where, like, I typically look at box score production after watching the tape, and I was like, "Really? 
I feel like I saw surprised how little sack production there was versus when you see how disruptive he is for Ohio State inside. Yeah, I'm like, I, yeah. did I see every one of the plays he made in the four games that I watched on this guy? Um, and he's young, man. He turns 21 in June. So he's going to get drafted at 20 years old, 6'3", yep. 290, 33 and a half inch arms, 10 10 inch hands. I just think he's ex- like looking at my my notes, explosive and knows how to attack blocks maximizes his length by winning with first contact and he keeps his hand, hands and feet engaged. Neutral does not, does not get moved by single blocks, disengages and hunts the football. Good rush variety that's built around quickness and length. Strong lateral movement skills. I, like these are, these are great traits, man. This is a good player. So I just did the, um, the Cleveland show that we have on the Locked On Network. Yeah. Um, and they asked me about, you know, their pick, their first picks at 55 or whatever. And Michael Slam Hall punk. came up and I was like, dude, if Michael Hall's there, like you guys should absolutely run the card in on that one. That's, that's a no brainer for a, a roster. That's pretty full. So like, I would not be surprised at all if he goes in the fifties. Like, yeah, I, Cleveland. And that's one of the things we talked about with them is like getting a little bit younger on the interior defensive line is mm-hmm. one of their pressing needs, right? It's right. a good look at a roster. So you mentioned the length at 33 and a half, which I think shows up for him as, as both a, a block deconstructor in the run game and a, uh, as a pass rusher, I wish he had a little bit more consistent anchor. He doesn't play super tall cause he's only six, two and a half, but I did think kind of leveraging, particularly when, when guys got up underneath of him, he, he had trouble pulling the e-brake and, and stopping himself in some of those instances. But if you're in a scheme, that's going to let him play forward. And I think part of the perception problem here, Joe, is he played 413 snaps defensively this year. He's played less than 700 snaps in the last two seasons combined. Like you put that against Byron Murphy, who who was a rotational guy, but managed to find similar production, but then had to split the successes with some of the other guys on that defensive line. And you put Johnny Newton in that mix. Like Johnny Newton, I think, played more snaps defensively this year than Michael Hall's played in the last two seasons combined. The dude doesn't come off the field. There's a couple of those guys in this class that just never yeah. come off. Yeah. So, so if you're just going to look at the raw box score and be like, "Oh, he didn't, he doesn't sack a quarterback," he's he's working with a fraction of the volume. He he's credited with an 18 and a half pass rush win rate. Yeah, in the Big Ten. You, I mean that you, you that can is, tell. Yeah, that's right there with Johnny Newton and Byron Murphy in this year's class as far as like the best pass rush efficiency creating pressure into your defensive lineman in this class. So you have the length, you have a one, six high 10 yard split. So like it, he tested and showed that first step explosiveness. It's an outstanding number for an interior defensive lineman playing at like 295, 300. All of that yeah. combined is like, okay, if this guy played 700 snaps in a season and maybe he has to get a little bit more consistent in the early downs to get to that stage as a player. But well, even if he's just a rotational pass rush guy, like he's going to be on the field, he's you're going to feel him. I feel like Ohio State's had these types of players through the years, whether it's like Tyquan Lewis or Draymond Jones, and those turned out to be pretty good players. Mm -hmm. I like Michael Hall coming out a lot more than either of those two guys who have turned out to be, you know, really solid players for the Colts. And I guess now, you know, Draymond has signed the big deal. He's a little more toolsy, right? Like at least at least least Tyquan's like, okay, he's he's a five defensive end. Who can rush inside if you want him to, but he he, he was like in the two seventies that he played it. Versus, uh, you have length here and explosiveness. Where it felt like a lot of the the twitchy guys inside for Ohio State that were bowling ball body builds, yeah, didn't have the length element that Michael Hall has too, and he he knows how to use it. Who are your third round grades? Uh, I have Tavondre Sweat, University of Texas. Chris Jenkins, University of Michigan. So that's the player that that you had uh, that we had not accounted for in mm-hmm. addition to Rook. Uh, Braden Fisk from Florida State. Yeah, I have Rook, Brandon Dorless, and Brand- Braden Fisk is my uh, last third round grade. I guess we should probably talk about Chris Jenkins because there is uh, there's a gap in our rankings here. Um, I, I I'm going to go back to something I said yesterday about um, wide receivers and that. I bet you we could sit down and watch the tape come away with similar takeaways but how we value it and how we project it moving forward is maybe where the differences are um i I, if you want to talk about box score production you're not going to love it for chris jenkins what four and a half tackles for loss two sacks this past season 
Uh, and I, I don't think volume of snaps was an issue there. Uh, maybe just overall good defense. So there wasn't a ton of like plays that had to be made because they're, you know, not having extended drives against them. But I think the athleticism here is is just what gets me very excited. Athleticism, flexibility, firm anchor against single blocks, the effort, um, how he showed up in some of the biggest moments of the season for Michigan. I'm a big fan. I wish that he had a little bit more contact balance, maybe he had a little bit more pop in his hands that he would you, use his tools to be a more consistent deconstructor of blocks when pass rushing. Like I definitely recognize some of the growth areas. I just feel comfortable about him being able to grow into those things. And I think some of the un uncoachable stuff is really, really exciting here. And um, he's my DT three. So the, the divide that I had was you talked about how you thought Michael Hall did good against single blocks. I thought that dynamic for Chris stood out a lot too, where in one-on-one -on -one situations where I'm able to lock peak and shed, you know, he has 34 inch arms. I thought you saw that with just feeling blocks and sitting in a line of scrimmage, but sometimes the um, swiftness in which he gets rid of the, the blocker uh, wasn't consistent game to game to game, but against double teams, we talked about Michael Hall anchoring. I thought Chris got, way too much guys into his body and pushed around way too much. And I thought he disproportionately took a lot of that uh, with how Michigan's scheme works. So if you're going to project him into a different defensive system where maybe he's not charged with taking so many double teams or he's, they're, 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 there's more one-on-one -on -one opportunities for him, I, I think maybe you could start to get some of the rep volume where the tools are going to be able to shine a little bit but I didn't think he was somebody who handled doubles well, and then he didn't have the pass rush menu that Michael Hall has. Uh, I think he has 20 pressures in each of the last two seasons at Michigan. So, And that's with – he played over 500 snaps in 2022, and I think he played 450 in 2023. So for me, it was just a matter of what's your value in early – or in late downs, early in your career, and then your early down stuff – there was a little bit of a divide with where I thought you were at your best versus where some of your reps had you consistently working and not doing you a good service. All right. We have some day three favorites we want to discuss. Uh, Kyle, I also want to hit you with some word association because I think we kind of, oh, I think there's more to say about these day two guys. So I think we can quickly get through that with some word association here on the other side of it. So be sure to stick with us. I've been told I'm a competitive person. Do you think that's true? Well, yeah, it is true. I have a competitive side to me. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves that you can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go. It's free on the App Store or Google Play. The floor is yours if you have word association yeah. that you would yeah. like to, I, to dive into. I'm giving these to you, man. I don't I don't need you to extend these back to me. I don't, you know, we know that this is not my calling card in life. Um, okay, so we talked about Jenkins and Michael Hall. Word association, Rook from Clemson. Toolsy. Yeah. It's all about the uh, it's all about the athletic ceiling there, right? Putting yep. it all together. And there's there's flashes where it it happens and you're like, okay, like it's just getting more consistent. I bet every defensive line coach in the league oh, yeah. would, would yeah. be super stoked to look at the cut up reel of his best plays yeah. and say, Hey, you get to work with this guy now. Yep. You know, that's they know that's how they work, man. They're like, they I can get it out of him. I right? can get it. Yeah. I can get it from him. Brandon Dorless, Oregon. Versatile. Yeah, I think that's that's a good call out there. I just wish he wasn't so high hipped and play with better leverage. Like everything else is so good here. Lock peak and shed, length, power, heavy hands. And when he gets when he gets an angle, man, he can close. Yeah. Just like, I, man, he's he somebody tall. I would love to see like be given a chance to settle at a spot 
and then build his versatility back out again. Oregon, like it's been 20 years of this at Oregon. You know, like going back to like, what is it, like Taylor Hart all the way to Armstead and Buckner. Okay. And now this guy, it was like never ending these types of players. Braden Fiske, Florida State. Um, high motor. Plays hard. He plays he has hard. Of, he plays fast. Fiske has a lot of fans out there. And, and he's a very, like, he's a very likable player in terms of demeanor. Uh, temperament, right? Like he plays extremely hard, fires off the ball. I worry about the projection here. He, he, he's got very short arms. It shows on tape. And I think he's just always going to have to work overtime to, to win. And if he isn't consistently out quicking players, I think he's going to, he's going to get washed. So okay. there's going to be some high, highs and lows there with that. Can, can I give you a stat here that yeah. I, I think outlines we, we've talked about, Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton and Michael Hall and some of these guys have pass rush win rates in the 16, 17, 18% range. Uh, Fiskies is eight and a half. Oh man. And I think that's length, right? If you're, if your wins come from cleanup plays because you're playing hard, or if your wins come because your first step lets you get hit to hit with a guy and you could just play through lateral contact when they try and ride you out. Great. How sustainable is that at the next level? That's the question. And I don't know that he has the athletic build to really build out a viable menu of counters. Also notable here in comparing Fisky to those other guys, Murphy, Newton, Michael Hall, all either 20 or 21 years old. Fisky's north of 24 already. Right, some, played, some, played what three years at Western Michigan before transferring to Florida State the past two years. He's a six-year senior, so Six, yeah, okay, four years. Yeah, he was at full. Western. Yeah, he lived a whole life and then lived another one. You know. Yeah. Um. Okay, I'm good on the word association. You want to talk through day three? I got, I got. There's a day three guy that I'm, I'm brimming about. I'm really can, excited. Can about. we talk about Tavondre Sweat first? Yes, I as we get into my day three grades, let's get is, to Tavondre. Is that the one that you're brimming to talk about? No, no. There's I mean, another one. Tavondre's run defense is so freaking good. Yeah, he's awesome. Awesome run defender. Incredible. And I get that there's weight management issues and I think it was somebody had had done in the scouts insider publishing that happens this time of year that he was up around 380 at the end of the season and then cut back down to 366 and he's been there and held there throughout the pre-draft process and that's why he didn't weigh in at the senior bowl. And I get that the, if you're in third and if you're in long and late downs, you'll probably have him off the field in favor of somebody who gives you more of a pass rush upside. He is so good against the run. I cannot get over it. And then obviously there was the DWI incident that just happened in the pre-draft process a few weeks ago. And that's going to cause some and create some big questions for you with teams to meet because all you have to do this time of year is not getting into trouble. It's like literally your only job other than the train is to not get into trouble and then like show up to all your meetings on time. So I, I get the questions that exist. At what point, at what intersection is what he does and does so freaking good outweigh the questions that exist for him? Third, fourth round. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Who had better run defense tape? Tavondre Sweat or Jordan Davis? Oh, it's Sweat. Which is just, it's crazy to me yeah. that they're that big of a divide. Yeah. For where one player got drafted and is perceived because he cut 30 pounds and blew the, the roof off Indianapolis. Who also had weight management questions. Versus this play, like Sweat's game tape playing the run is better than Jordan Davis. I agree. A uh, lot of questions about both of those players. Um, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm off the soapbox. I get it. I, I understand. You and you and your nose tackles, man. It's a thing. Um, the guy, the day three guy that I really, really enjoyed is yeah, Mackay Wingo. Go, uh, go oh, ahead. it's yeah. not Mackay Wingo. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it is Mackay Wingo. It that's is what, uh, yeah, it's, that's not who my guess would. Have. Oh, so go ahead. 
Who'd you think I was going to like? Uh, Dwayne Carter from Duke. I, yeah, I Makai Wingo might be a better version of that player. Okay. Um, man, I just was excited. I, juice, man, this guy's got legit athleticism. I know he's six foot, two hundred and eighty four pounds. So like, you better be explosive. But like that one six three ten yard split on a four eight five forty yard dash, man. Like seeing him rush, he's really loose and flexible. They had him rushing like you know as a five tech from time to time and on the interior. I think he's got really exciting penetration skills and there's there's good contact balance. And I don't know, maybe I was I was I was so underwhelmed by watching his running mate there, Mason Smith. And oh my um, God. <laughs> you know, maybe 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 that really made Makai Wingo look a lot better. But my goodness, like if I'm looking for like a spark plug fourth round um that I think can be like a a, a penetration style player for my my defense or you know, even even maybe even some five maybe some some two gapping on the edge might be a little bit of, of a of a tall order but he was he was just a really fun watch at this point in the process um the high the high water i i carry a low five early six on wingo so i'm a little lower than you are uh i just thought the high water marks were really good but i thought he was washed out of stuff way too often um and as a smaller player who is a penetration player, I think he's like if you strike out on Fisk in on day two, maybe you could come back on day three and kind of get that same kind of player in Makai Wingo. Yeah, I think you, I'd much rather have Wingo on day three than Fisk on day two. Yeah, because they both don't have good length, but, I mean, Wingo's got 32-inch arms. Who's your – Fisk is a little bit more high football IQ. And I think Wingo, I think Wingo's at, at times just the uh, chaos, create chaos with penetration. And that's yes, where good, fun. good things that's happen. Fun, though. It fun. is fun. It is fun. Who's your day three guy that you like? Um, probably Dwayne Carter from Duke. Uh, I think there's a pass rush profile here that um, I could see having some translatability. I don't think he has any necessarily like dominant traits. Uh, I think he has a good first step. I think he's got a better build than some of the other guys that we're talking about in this stage. I was hoping I could say Leonard Taylor. Um, yeah. It's just not pretty. It wasn't pretty this year. And I know he was dealing with some, some injuries and he was playing on the nose for Miami. And so they had him playing him out of position, but just a, a disaster for a player that I watched in, in July. I was like, dude, this, this might be one of the most physically gifted interior defensive linemen in the class. And that light bulb never came on. Um, so I would say Dwayne Carter's probably the one I have a, he's the, one of the two guys I have a four on, uh, it's him and Mason Smith, which could not be different players. Mason Smith, dude, you could raise your eyebrows all you want, but the athletic profile for that five-star player shines very brightly. And unfortunately there's not a lot of other stuff that does on his tape, but for the same reasons that somebody says, I can fix this guy. I can make Rook do this every play. The same thing's going to happen for Mason Smith. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes in the top 100. Should he? Oh, I'm sure he That's will. A totally different conversation. Sure he will. Uh, Pre-draft visitor of the Buffalo Bills, Kyle Krabs. Um, so, Dude was built in the lab. Yeah, and then that's the end of the good things about him. Um, uh, Real quick to work through this. Fourth round grades for me, Mekhi Wingo, LSU, Tavondre Sweat, Texas. And I did, I docked him for the DWI. Also, he'd be very much a day two prospect. Okay. Uh, fifth round grades, Justin Boigby, Alabama. If he wasn't injured, he'd be a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Dwayne Carter, Duke, Fabian Love at Florida State. And then my sixth round grades, Mason Smith, Christian Boyd out of Northern Iowa. All right. So I had uh, my fours were Dwayne Carter and Mason Smith. Boigby was my five. Uh, and then I had six round grades on Leonard Taylor, Tyler Davis, Makai Wingo, and then McKinley Jackson uh, from Texas A&M. And then I had a seven on Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa. Comfortably that last guy. Uh, uh, by about the same gap from Johnny Newton to Michael Hall is McKinley Jackson and Christian Boyd. Hey, listen, another Buffalo Bills pre-draft visitor, Christian Boyd. So oh, it's just, we, we're <laughs> not going to throw, throw any, um, any dirt on here that we don't need to, but I think it's worth acknowledging Christian Boyd. Cause you and I talked about him off air the other day when you just go through the punch list, right? There's <laughs> he's an older prospect from a small school who didn't test well, 
and doesn't have good length and didn't rush the passer all that well. So you just work through all of it. And I know like there's some buzziness there because he had a nice week at the shrine game. And I, so I understand like the pre-draft process, they, all of those things matter. So like he does check that box for going down there and, and showing some wins there in that regard. But I think if you look at the full menu for Christian Boyd, like that would not be a player I would be excited about my team at. What, what number? Like there's, there's a lot that has to click into place that you just don't have a lot of confidence based on historical yeah. data and trends that you feel like it would happen. Let somebody else figure them out. That's going to do it for us here on Locked on NFL Scouting. Kyle Krabs, Joe Marino. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Make it a great rest of your day. We are out of here.